starting on uh, page 997 in the 11th edition, 1240 in the 10th. <clears throat> Passionate shepherd to his love. Let me, um, I think I told you to read. Scarborough Fair on 731 and to listen to the um, Simon and Garfunkel version that I provided a link to, or at least I provided the lyrics to. Um, I'm not going to say really anything about that poem other than It dates from a collection of manuscripts, or ballads date generally from manuscript collections of around 1500 AD. They probably go back two or 300 years before that. That is, most ballads probably go back to the 11, 12, 1300s. Scarborough Fair is often taken to be a love poem. It's not. Look at it carefully, and what does the speaker say all throughout? You know, she once was a true love of mine. She once was a true love of mine. She once was, is the refrain, every line, until you get to the end. And the last stanza, the refrain is, and then she shall be a true love of mine. Well, what's the condition that will make the person, the, the woman being described, to be a true love of the singers or the, the speakers? It's an impossible condition. He lists several things that she must be in order to be a true love. Each of the conditions is totally impossible. Simon and Garfunkel take the song, they rewrite it a little bit. They keep some of the same lines, personally saved Rosemary in time. For example, you know, are you going to Scarborough Fair, etc. They update it. It still sounds like a beautiful love poem, but it still has that tinge of unrequited love. Okay? Turn then to 997. The Passionate Shepherd to His Love by Christopher Marlowe. Marlowe is a contemporary of Shakespeare's. Um, Shakespeare refers to him in a couple of plays and possibly in some of the sonnets. Marlowe died pretty soon after Shakespeare arrived in London. We don't know exactly when Shakespeare arrived in London, but he was probably there by 1590. He was definitely there by 1592. In Marlowe and the Passionate Shepherd to His Love, he's writing a, what's called a pastoral lyric. Pastoral. It's set out in nature. Away from the city, away from courts, away from government, away from civilization, away from buildings and such. Okay? And he creates this idealized view of nature. This poem was responded to by several other poets. Um, I used to teach it. I've given you a link to one. Sir Walter Raleigh's response. Uh, where'd it go? The nymph's reply to the shepherd. John Dunn has a response called the bait. Um, and there's another three or four at least. Okay? And that's one reason for that is when... One of these authors in the late 16th century, early 17th century, 17th century, kind of wrote a poem, especially if it was this idealized view of love. A lot of other poets would then go, really? Come on. That's not what love is like. And they'd write, you know, satiric responses. Okay. So, passionate shepherd to his love. Come live with me and be my love and we will all the pleasure prove. They rhymed in Marlowe's day. More like Love and prove. Come live with me and be my love, and we will all the pleasure prove that valleys, groves, hills, and fields, woods, or steepy mountain yields. Okay, so what kind of pleasures do valleys, groves, hills, and fields, woods, or steepy mountain yields? It's this kind of, I'm going to use this from Blake uh, as an example. Pre-fall, Genesis, Garden of Eden images. Okay? And we will sit upon the rock, seeing the shepherds feed their flocks by shallow rivers to whose falls melodious birds sing madrigals. So the birds are out there singing their beautiful songs, and we're watching the shepherds. And I will make thee beds of roses and a thousand fragrant posies, a 
cap of flowers and a kirtle, a dress or skirt, embroidered all with leaves of, leaves of myrtle. So our clothing is going to be made of natural vegetation. They're going to sleep on rose petals, you know, pretty and soft and aromatic and all that kind of stuff. A gown made of the finest wool, which from our pretty lambs we pull. Fair lined slippers for the cold with buckles of the purest gold. Notice what's skipped. So we're going to pull wool from the lambs. How's he going to make it into a gown? What's not been mentioned? How do you go from raw wool to fabric? You have to. Textile, but you have to spin it. You have to weave it on a loom. Okay? But then we're going to be out there in a beautiful natural world. And it's all just going to be, I'll pull the wool off and it'll magically turn into a gown for you. Okay? Fair line slippers for the cold with buckles of the purest gold. The gold's just going to be lying around on the ground. We'll just fashion it easily. <coughs> Sorry, the cold I got last week just won't shake. A belt of straw and ivy buds with coral clasps and amber studs. Coral? Out in the natural world? Only if you're aerial and you live under the sea, you know. And if these pleasures may thee move, come live with me and be my love. If everything I've just described moves you, come on, honey, let's go out to the woods. The shepherd swain shall dance and sing for thy delight each May morning. If these delights thy mind may move, live with me and be my love. And then you get in your syllabus the shepherd's, excuse me, the nymph's reply. And what the nymph does in the reply, read it, is she takes each image that the shepherd says and turns it on its head. And by that I mean... She takes each image and she looks at it realistically, not idealistically. Really? You want to go live out in the woods? Well, this nice, beautiful, late spring, early summer day is quickly going to turn to what? December. And then it's going to be cold. In your little amber, you know, your little straw bed and rose bed, those aren't going to be comfortable. And what do you have to get through in order to get to the rose petals? Thorns. Life ain't going to be so grand. Okay? And Raleigh's is just one of many that does that. Why? They're trying to outdo each other. It's, still, it's like a bunch of schoolboys. Oh, yeah? Well, and they just keep one-upping. Okay? Go from there to... So read... Nymph's reply to the shepherd, because it might show up on the, anything on the syllabus can show up on the final exam. Um, go to the lamp, 768. I used to have these arranged so that everything was in page order, and the book was redone, so I <clears throat> haven't remodified it. 768. William Blake, okay. So Christopher Marlowe, contemporary Shakespeare, playwright, poet, spy for Queen Elizabeth. We know he was a spy for Queen Elizabeth. Died in a bar brawl, according to the anecdote. Some say that it wasn't a bar brawl. It was a hit. He was assassinated by someone because of information that he had. Anyway, so William Blake. Uh, Blake was a very interesting character. He was a poet, he was a prose writer, he wrote literary criticism, he wrote famous criticism of John Milton's Paradise Lost, which I'll talk about very briefly in a moment. He was an illustrator, by which I mean he did um, metal engraving, which was then used for plates to create images. He, he was a painter, okay? He illustrated his own poems. So the Songs of Innocence is a book of poetry that he did with his own illustrations, Songs of Experience, a later book of poetry that he did. This one, I believe, 1779. This one, 1789. This one, 1794. Um, he was a mystic. He had visions. According to Blake, one day he was either in his home or he's at a pub. I can't remember which of the two. 
And he saw the forehead of God pressed on a window. And people are like, <laughs> exactly what Yusuf just did. What? Yep. That's what he said. Anyways. So this is the lamb. This is from the collection called Songs of Innocence. This poem is always except, excerpted in books of poetry for kids. All right? Robert Louis Stevenson did one of those first books in the 19th century called The Child's Garden of Verses. This was kind of like front and center. Listen to it. You can tell it's, in one sense, it's kind of meant for children. Little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee? Gave thee life and bid thee feed by the stream and o'er the mead. Softest clothing, woolly, uh, gave thee clothing of delight. Softest clothing, woolly bright. Gave thee such a tender voice, making all the veils rejoice. Little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee? Little lamb, I'll tell thee, little lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name, for he calls himself a lamb. He is Mike, uh, he is Mike. He is meek and he is mild. He became a little child. I a child and thou a lamb. We are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. Who's the little lamb? Is it a little out in the field? Could be. Probably a child, a little person. Okay? And so the speaker just asked, do you know who made you? Yeah, mommy, daddy. No, <laughs> not mommy and daddy. Who gave you life? Who bid thee feed by the stream and o'er the meat? Now that is a real lamb. Softest clothing, woolly bright. In other words, clean, clear, pure, innocent. Okay. In the second stanza, we move from the lamb out in the field to... He's called by thy name. He, the one who made you, is called a lamb. John's gospel, I think it is. No, I take the back. Not John's gospel. Jesus is getting ready to meet John the Baptist. John the Baptist sees him from a distance. He tells his followers, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's the Agnus Dei, Lamb of God. All kinds of famous Renaissance paintings of this image. He's called by thy name, for he calls himself A. And then notice it's capitalized. Why? Because lamb there is sacrificial. Okay? He is meek, he is mild, he became, this lamb, capitalized, became a child. I a child and thou a lamb. We are called by his name. I a child and thou a lamb. Who's the I? Is the I the speaker or is the I now referring to a little child and thou, God, Christ, a lamb? We are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. Notice, it's very sing-song. It's very lullaby-ish in a sense. Okay? That's from the Songs of Innocence. Right? Are little lambs evil? Are little lambs like, you know, cats playing with mice, let it go, then pounce and slash it and let it go and suck its head? No. My cats are evil. Our cats have always been evil. Though one cat we used to have would kill a mouse. I'm not kidding. I'm God's truth there. Would kill a mouse or a rabbit or a squirrel, eat everything but the head. Front door to our house. We'd go out in the morning, and there'd be the cat's, or the mouse's, or the rabbit's, or the squirrel's head facing the door, <laughs> sitting on the neck, what's left of the neck. It's like sacrifice to the dark gods, you know, kind of thing. Sadistic little creatures. So then we get the tiger. The tiger is found in songs of experience. Well, what's the difference between a lamb and a tiger? Our tiger's evil. Our tiger's not innocent. I mean, this is in the ones of experience. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What a mortal hand or eye could, fear, could frame thy fearful symmetry. In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? 
And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? So, why is the tiger burning bright in the night? It's louder. Louder? It's eyes. Eyes? Could be. What else? Orange. Orange color, which would stand out at night. The black wouldn't. The black stripes wouldn't. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? Have you ever watched a tiger move? I mean, you go to a zoo or whatever. Most of them are just lying there sleeping because, you know, life's not worth living because they have nothing to chase, so to speak. But, you know, you go to a wild safari kind of thing, and you'll see tigers, well, just watch a house cat on the hunt for a bird or something. And then imagine that 100 times bigger, okay? The way they slink, the way you can watch their muscles move, that's what he's getting at. What immortal, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy symmetry? Notice the hand or eye that framed the tiger has to be immortal. Why? So that the tiger couldn't kill it once it was made. Okay? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? I have a ring. I think I've mentioned it before. It's the one with like a Roman or knight's face. But it's made out of tiger's eye. The gem, tiger's eye. So it's got dark and light. And if I remember right, it's light on the outside and dark in the middle. Like the slit of a cat's eye. In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? Notice the fire that provided the light for the tiger's eye doesn't come from where? <laughs> it's not just, you know, a fire burning on the ground. It's not just a campfire. No, this fire is like sacred, hidden fire. On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? Two different mythological images there, I think. The first one, on what wings dare he aspire? Icarus and Daedalus, okay? What happened? Flew up. Icarus had wings of wax and feathers. Flew up. Father warned him, don't get too close to the sun. It'll melt, you'll fall. He goes, nah, gets too close to the sun, wings melt, and he dies. Okay? The second one, what the hand dare seize the fire? The myth of Prometheus, who seized fire from the gods. What did the god do to penalize him or punish him? Anybody know the myth? He's chained to a mountain for all eternity, and an eagle comes and rips his liver out. And the liver grows back, and the eagle, like daily. And it's painful. It's not, you know, oh, this isn't real, kind of a... What shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of the heart? What sinew? It's muscle could make that muscle. Why? Because what does that muscle do? The beat. And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand, that is, what did the boom, boom, and what dread feet, that is, the meter? What is a foot, metrically speaking? It is the repetition of a stressed and unstressed or unstressed and stress syllable. And how you arrange those gives you different kind of feet and different kinds of meter. What the hammer, 
What the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What chain? Well, it's kind of, you know, symbolizing this linking, this forging of a chain. What? How is your brain forged? What the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? Why is the more terrible part the tiger's brain than its heart? What are tigers, maybe metaphorically, thought to be? Cunning. Have you ever watched a cat hunt? One of my cats yesterday, a little scrawny thing, beats up the big fat orange one, the ginger. It's like 18 pounds. The other cat's 10 or 11 pounds. But it's older. And it scrunches down on the ground even when it's in plain view. Okay? And the other cat will walk by and it pounces. That's what's being got. Because that's going on here. That's not going on here. It's cunning. It's thinking. It's plotting. When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Probably another mythological or mythical story. When did the stars throw down their spears? When do they water heaven with their tears? Possibly alluding to the satanic rebellion in heaven. Satan, by the way, what does it mean, the name? It doesn't mean the great evil one. No, nope. just means adversary. So when the Mullahs in Iran go out there and chant death to Satan, death to the great Satan, they're just saying death to our great enemy, death to our great adversary. That's all it means. They don't mean literally, you know, hooves, horns, tail, pitchfork. Well, some of them might, but. Water heaven with their spears? Or with their tears? Well, according to traditional kind of Christianity, usually the number that is used is that when Satan fell, a third of the angels fell with him. So the tears are probably. Once they fell, they realized, oops, and now let me take a pause. William Blake wrote criticism, literary criticism, about John Milton's Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost is this really long poem. It's like that thick, okay? Originally 10 books, Milton revised it to be 12 books. It's about the fall of Adam and Eve. More specifically, it's, to use his words, to justify the ways of God to man. In other words, if God is good, why is the world the way it is? Okay? And in it, we see the creation of Adam and Eve. We see God singling out the Son, as Christ, as the one to redeem the world, you know, all that kind of stuff. And we see the fall of Satan. In the third book of that big, big, long poem, there's a scene where Satan and all of his fallen angels are pinned, <coughs> excuse me, pinned to the lake of fire. <coughs> Meanwhile, God's up in his heaven, and he looks down at Satan, and he smirks or grins. By smirking or grinning, he allows Satan to kind of get up on his elbow off the fire. And Satan's like, you know, if I could only get all the way up, man, I could really do some damage. And God's like, Go for it. And he allows Satan to rise. In that scene, Satan then delivers one of the great rousing speeches of all literary history. I mean, it if you've ever seen Independence Day, you know, the president jumps on that Humvee or plane, I can't remember what it is, and he gives us, it's gonna be our Independence Day, we're gonna defeat the nasty SOB aliens, etc. Well, that's a ripoff of Shakespeare's. St. Crispin's Day speech by Henry V in the play Henry V. There's a whole host of these kinds of speeches throughout history. Rouse the people to lead up and oppose a great evil. Okay? 
Satan gets the greatest of them all. So that Blake wrote that John Milton was secretly of the party of Satan. Meaning, he really liked Satan. He gave Satan all the best lines. Other critics have said, no, you don't really understand what Milton's doing there. <clears throat> because Satan was what, in the traditional Christian theology, of the created order, that is, the highest angelic being to the lowest particle of physics. Satan was the highest. He was the pinnacle. He was called the son of the morning star. The morning star? Christ. He wasn't equal near to Christ because he was created. Christ was uncreated, the only begotten of the Father kind of thing. Okay? So, all of that. When the stars came down to heaven, so the angelic demonic rebellion, so to speak, did he smile his work to see? Who's the he smiling? God. Did God smile when there was a rebellion in heaven? Because in Milton's Paradise Lost, he does. He's just like, I'm so far removed from this. You can't touch me. You think you're going to overthrow me? Go away, little bug. Okay? Which a lot of critics did have issues with. By the way, it's why C.S. Lewis wrote Paralander, the second book in his space trilogy. Lewis also wrote a little book called A Preface to Paradise Lost. And one of the things he does in that book is he takes apart Blake's criticism. So, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Did the same God who made the innocent little man, man out in the woods, you know, hopping around, white fleece and everything, make the tiger that's going to run through the woods and eat the little lamb? Tigers and songs of experience. Lambs is, lamb is in songs of innocence. It's like what we have in this. These are images of the world, so to speak, before the fall. These are images after the fall. In other words, innocent, sinful. There's another, Blake wrote a lot of poems. There used to be a poem in this book. They've taken it out to fit something else in called The Chimney Sweep. You familiar with it? Yeah. <laughs> Chimney Sweeps, Blake's Day, late 18th century, early 19th century, were often children, orphans. And their job would be to climb up and down flues of chimneys and to do this as they did, because their bodies were small, they could fit in a flue like this wide, and because they were malnourished. And their bodies would wipe all the soot and creosote off the chimneys. They also had brushes, okay? But most of them died before they reached 20 years old because of tuberculosis and cancer, okay? Tiger, now look at the last stanza, because at first it sounds like a repeat of the first stanza. But there's one difference. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. Would a mortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Not could frame thy fearful symmetry. It's almost like the speaker is saying, how does this work, God? How does the world be like this, the lamb, so has this. Okay. Go from there to 758. My heart leaps up. Wordsworth is another romantic. Blake's a romantic. I'm going to talk about romantic in a minute. Wordsworth, Byron, Coleridge. We're not reading any. Yes, we did. Coleridge is Kubla Khan. Is on the syllabus. I'm just not going to talk about it. Um, Coleridge, Keats, and Shelley, they're all romantics. What does that mean? They emphasize these things, nature, as opposed to civilization 
in cities and towns and courts and buildings, okay? They emphasize meaning and religious and or religious experience from the natural world. Going out and having a <gasps> experience, having your breath taken away, being sensible with a film of awe or wonder, seeing the ordinary in life as being extraordinary. Like seeing a dandelion and being overtaken by the beauty of a dandelion. Especially if that dandelion isn't growing out in the grass like out here, but like in a crack in a city sidewalk. Because what is the dandelion serving as when you see it on the sidewalk? It's an element of beauty in an otherwise ugly situation. And childlike innocence, wonder, or awe. Why childlike? Go out with a three-year-old on a walk somewhere. And the three-year-old's going to pick up all kinds of crap and go, oh, look at this bottle cap. This is th Put it down. It's trash. You don't know where that thing's been. But look at this cool rock. It's just a rock. It's a chunk of cement. It's not even a rock kind of thing. Okay? In other words, they haven't become what? That, I won't say you guys, that I've become jaded by life where you wake up and it just hurts and you just won't go back to bed. And you wake up the, and it's even worse, you know? My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. What does it mean my heart leaps up? Does his heart literally jump? No. It said, oh, look at that. Every now and then, you know, it's really cool after there's some big volcanic eruption somewhere because about a month or two later, or wildfires out in the West. I don't wish wildfires out on the West, but when there are wildfire, wildfires throughout California and the Western Mountain States, we often get what? Really great sunsets. Because there's all that smoke and dust in the air. That's what makes the sky red at night. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began? So is it now I am a man? So be it when I shall grow old, or let me die. So, when I was a little kid, my heart also leapt up when I saw a rainbow. Look, Daddy. So is it now I am a man? I still, the speaker is telling us, have that experience. But now, I'm not a child, I'm a man. So be it. In other words, cue the Beatles. Let it be when I shall grow old, comma, or what? Or let me die. Let me die when? Now. If I ever lose thy childlike wonder, let me die before that happens. The child is father of the man. How? Biologically, we're told it's the other way around. Comes before because the man or woman does what? Grows out of the child. Oh, and I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. What's piety? It's not a word that's used very much today. It's religious devotion. But here, it's natural piety. It's the kind of piety that comes from going out, being in the natural world, and just kind of going, wow, isn't this amazing? Okay? If you've never seen, there, seen them, if you've never been there, take a trip sometime, go out to California, go to the Redwoods. You've never seen... Some would say, I'm kind of a, of this because I'm from there. You've never seen a real tree until you've seen a giant redwood. And there are giant redwoods. The diameter of the tree is the width of this room. And you look up and you can't see the tops of the trees because they're two, 300 feet tall. And they're 2,000 years old. 
or go down to the Gulf Coast or South Carolina and see some of the live oaks that are several hundred years old that I've seen one before that literally from the center of its trunk to where its branches are all stretched out, its branches would be the width of Peck Hall. I mean, huge, okay? What's he saying? I want to be like that child who does what? Every day is full of that kind of wonder. I never want to experience a moment when I'm like, it's just a freaking tree and it makes a mess. You know, because every fall, what does it do? It drops its leaves. And these trees, they drop their walnuts and they're a pain to mow over. So you have to pick them up and do, okay? From there to 780, another poem by Wordsworth. The world is too much with us. Little sonnet. <clears throat> now this one's quite a bit different than the previous one. This one is very similar to, well, it's similar in some ways to Gerard Manley Hopkins's God's Grandeur, where in the Sestet, Hopkins describes humanity as doing what to nature, wearing it down, ignoring it. The world is too much with us. Late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away a sordid boon. What does the first line mean? The world is too much with us. It's like we carry it around in our pockets. Meaning, acquiring. We do what? Late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Spending there doesn't only mean like monetarily. Monetary spending. Getting, what's another word for spending? When you spend money, do you have it anymore? No, you use it up. So getting and using. We do what? We waste our, what is, what's our powers? Our lives. We just become, the word that's used today, consumer. We take something and we, and it's gone. And we do that more and more and more. Little we see out there in nature that is ours, meaning a connection to us. Little do we see ourselves out there. Okay, he's writing this in 1807. Imagine he's writing it today, nearly 200 years later. 1807, people were a whole lot more connected to nature than we are today. Why? They didn't have these things. They didn't have air conditioning. They didn't have these things. They didn't. Much, much more, we would say, you'll hear people talk today, uh, at the mercy of nature. Implying nature has what over us? Power, judgment, kind of. Really big hurricane hits. Really big earthquake hits. Really big tornado outbreak hits. What do we often hear in the news? Mother Nature, or the natural world, or Gaia, if you're one of those modern pagans, Gaia is angry at us. As if we are somehow what from nature? Removed, not part of. We are part of the natural world. We just like, we kind of have this arrogance. I used to teach, my, my first couple of years here, teaching comp, I used a book called The Arrogance of Humanism, which is about how we think we can control everything. How, how do you know that we think we can control everything? Have you ever been to Florida? There's these big buildings on the coast. Not smart. Why? Hurricanes usually, 
relatively frequently hit those parts, okay? California, where I'm from, there's this big old crack in the ground. It's called the San Andreas Fault. You can walk to it, you can walk over it, you can see it. You don't wanna be there when it rips, but there are very close to the San Andreas Fault, huge buildings built. In fact, San Francisco is built about 10 miles east of where it enters the Pacific Ocean. San Francisco is built entirely on built up ground. There's no bedrock. So when a really big earthquake hits, that turns to essentially quicksand, just whoosh, gone. That's arrogance. 93, when I started here, the upper Midwest, it, well, actually throughout the Midwest, had terrible flooding from snow runoff, snow melt, and heavy spring rains. Mississippi was way, I mean, like miles outside of its boundaries, okay? And it was determined about a year later, most of the flooding was caused by us. Why? Because back in the 30s, under the Roosevelt administration, the Army Corps of Engineers, brilliant geniuses that they are, said, you know, we can control the Mississippi River. Mm. No, not really. And the Mississippi decided to prove it then, okay? And I, again, act of genius. What's at the end of the Mississippi River before it enters into the Gulf? There's a little town. Anybody know what it's called? New Orleans. New Orleans. It's in a bowl, yeah. which is entirely below sea level. Not a smart thing to do. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away a sordid boon. A boon? That's a reward. That's what you get for giving something away. Okay? You give away $25,000, you get a crappy car. You give away $100,000, you get a less crappy car. But what are you really giving away? Your heart, the speaker is saying, what do we get in, re in exchange? Stuff. The sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours, and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. The sea doesn't cover itself in front of the moon, right? Notice the, the gendered, sexual, whatever you want to call it, you know, the sea shows her bosom. She flashes herself to the moon. No, totally exposed. The winds howl at all hours. They can't be controlled. For this, and are gathered now like sleeping flowers, for this, for everything, we are out of tune. That is, we don't respond. And the image here is of an aeolian harp, a harp that makes sound how? by blowing through things. Go out to his, the woods during a windstorm. I love tornadoes. Uh, no, I don't love tornadoes anymore. Always wanted to see one. Saw two, was in one. Don't need anymore. Love being out in the weather during thunderstorms. I used to love to do long when I was marathoning. Used to do, love to do long runs during electrical storms. I know, people are like, you're crazy, because there's lightning. <laughs> My hair is standing on end. Out of tune means we're not in sync. We're not in harmony with nature. It, the world out there, moves us not. We are the harps. We are not responding. We're not producing a tune in connection with the natural world. And then you get the sestet. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckle than a creed outworn. A pagan, a believer of an old dead religion, suckled, nursed on, fed by, what? A belief system that nobody accepts anymore. Why? So might I. 
Thus might I, standing on this pleasant lee, a little promontory looking out into the ocean, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn. What's forlorn mean? A little more than different. Lost. Alienated. Isolated. Alone. I would see something that would make me feel less lost. What would he see? Have sight of Proteus rising from the sea. Or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. But he's not a pagan suckled by a creed out water. So now when he looks at the ocean, what does he see? Just the ocean. What does he hear? Just the ocean. What's his point? How one believes, what one believes, affects what you see. He's saying, if I had the belief system that said Proteus was real or Triton was real, what would I see? If you're a strict materialist, scientific materialist, only what we see is what is real, the speaker is saying, you're not going to have what? These kinds of experiences. You know, because a rainbow will be what? It's a reflection of light. It's the refraction of light. The little water droplets up in the atmosphere and the sun shines through a lip. Rory G. Biff. Rather than, what's the mythic story? God promised Noah that whenever you see this, it's my covenant. I'll never destroy the world by flood again. Okay? Go from there to... We have time? Yes, we do. 1048. She walks in beauty. This is by George Gordon, Lord Byron. Quiz or exam. If this shows up, you can put down George Gordon or Lord Byron, or you can put down George Gordon, comma, Lord Byron, but don't put down, students have done this, George Byron. Or Lord Gordon, because those aren't the those aren't the same thing. Similarly, poems by Gerard Manley Hopkins. He's not Manley Hopkins. He's not Gerard Manley. He's not Gerard Hopkins. It's got to be all three. Okay. I was trying to remember in my first class. I read an article in the last year or two. This is about a specific person. Byron met this woman. And part of my mind is telling me that it's Mary Shelley, but I know it's not Mary Shelley. Byron did have, if I remember correctly, it's been over 30 years since I've studied any stuff about Byron. Byron did have a short fling with Mary Shelley. Who's Mary Shelley? Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. Wollstonecraft, her maiden name, Shelley. She is married to Percy Bysshe Shelley, who wrote the Ode to the West Wind that we um, she walks in beauty like the nine of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes. Thus mellowed to that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies. Okay? So notice, she walks in beauty. Does that mean she walks beautifully? Does that mean beauty attends to her like wherever she goes? There's beauty, unclear. Like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's breast of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes. In other words, is it pitch black? I don't think so. It's like twilight. So there's some light, but there's some darkness. All right? One shade the more, one ray the less, had half impaired the nameless dress. It's meant to rhyme, but doesn't. Um, excuse me. That, no, it's not. Tr less runs of trust, had half impaired the nameless grace which waves in every raven tress or softly lightens her face. What color is her hair? Raven. Black. Okay? 
So why the one shade, the more, one ray, the less, would impair the grace of her hair? Something that's black, this doesn't work because it's not shiny. But something that's shiny, like even these sunglass case, I can set it here, and depending on how I move it, it's black, and yet at the same time, it's showing light from the lights. And it's light, and yet black at the same time. Okay? He's saying a little bit more light, a little bit more darkness would destroy the beauty of her hair. Which waves in every raven dress or softly lightens o'er her face, where thoughts serenely sweet express, that is, her face expresses serene thoughts, how pure, how dear their dwelling place. Where are thoughts dwelling place? In the head. And on that cheek and o'er that brow, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent. How can a forehead be eloquent? The smiles that win, the tints that glow, but tell of days and goodness spent. Well, it's not just the brow, the forehead. It's really the whole face. And her face says what? An awful lot. Chapman, I think it was Chapman, wrote a poem in 16th century. He translated some Homer. And he wrote a line, he wrote a sonnet on, no, it might be Keats, in fact. I'm first looking into Chapman's Homer, who mentioned the face that launched a thousand ships. And in that same passage, we're told a picture does what? Paints a thousand words. You don't need words if you have imagery. And on that cheek and o'er the brow, so soft, so calm, so eloquent, the smiles that win, the tints that glow, but tell of days in goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent, the mind at peace with all below. Some take that to mean looking down on others. It's not what it's meant. A mind at peace with all below, what gets mentioned next? The heart. A heart whose love is innocent. In other words, this mind and this heart, they're not at war. Usually English literature and older, even going back to the ancient Greeks, there's a contest in the human body between the mind and the heart. The heart being the seat of what are called the passions. What's going to be in control? Are you going to be dominated by your emotions or by your thoughts? And it's the struggle between those two. Here, the person being described is at total peace. There's not a struggle between the heart and the will, meaning the passions. Okay, we'll stop there. We will pick up uh, Wednesday with dog's death. I did in the one um, video lecture, so we won't do that. We'll do do not go gentle into that good night and try to finish as many of the rest of the poems as we can. If we don't, I'll probably send along a video link. All right. Thank you.